Hello and welcome to the Stephen and Peter Sachs Museum. I'm Neshka Pfeiffer, Sachs Museum curator and your host and moderator for the Botanical Resonance Online Artist Talk Series, which is brought to you by the Missouri Botanical Garden and exhibition sponsors, Nancy and Kenneth Kranzberg, the Thomas A. Kuyumjin Family Foundation, and Tony and Cindy Kuyumjin. Today's presentation by artist Kevin Harris gives us some insight into his creative process in designing the sound installation, Welcome Home Habitat, for the exhibition currently on view at the Sachs Museum, Botanical Resonance, Plants and Sounds in the Garden. Today's talk will be about 15 minutes with time for Q&A after Kevin's video presentation. We are able to offer accessibility features, including ASL interpretation and live captioning, which you can access via the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. To turn that off or for more options, just click on that closed caption feature. Today's program will be recorded and posted on the Missouri Botanical Gardens YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Kevin Harris lives and works in St. Louis as an artist, curator, composer, and electrical engineer. His practice is broadly focused on using media installations to establish methods of communication and communal conditions by which to explore the psychological manifestations of industry and empire. Kevin is known for his large scale sculptural installations involving sound, video, text, electronics, motors, wood, and metal. In 2016, Kevin designed Octorarium, a multi-sensory media environment installed inside the Regional Arts Commission St. Louis, which was utilized as a gallery installation and performance event platform. He was artist in residence at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, where he curated the sound art series, Audible Interruptions. Prior to that, he ran the St. Louis performance space, Floating Laboratories. He is currently program director at the nonprofit arts organization, Herding Cats Collective. His most recent solo exhibition, Media Garden, was an outdoor electronic media environment utilizing the landscape of the Granite City Arts and Design District. Kevin, thanks so much for creating this wonderful artwork for our visitors and for being with us today to talk about your process. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Harris, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about my sound installation that is currently at the Botanical Gardens. Um, but first, if uh, for those who haven't seen and heard the sound installation, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play a quick video example that, uh, that shows it. Okay, so um, this installation was initially uh, envisioned as, as a sort of a gift to visiting plants at the garden, um, plants that are not native to, to Missouri and plants that have evolved uh, in, in a much different sonic environment. Um, so, so I wanted to sort of give these plants something, uh, something that they're used to, something that they might be missing. Um, and I chose to, to recreate this sonic environment, in this case, uh, the Amazon rainforest. Um, I chose to recreate it synthetic um, using synthesizers and sound synthesis. Uh, the reason I chose to recreate the installation synthetically, as opposed to, uh, for instance, playing back recorded sounds from this environment, is that as a gift, I, I wanted to, to, to give the plants um, something that only humans can make. Uh, I didn't want to simply just play back their own sounds to them. I wanted to, 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 to do it in a way that uh, only humans uh, are, are capable of doing. Um, so also, I guess, on a, on a, on a different level, a level that is more unique to my own practice as a sound artist um, and that as, as a musician, um, I wanted to explore the relationship between representation and abstraction. 
uh, since I am representing a recreation of this rainforest, um, I, I thought it was important to, to, to be aware of how representation and abstraction have functioned throughout the history of music, but also the history of uh, visual art. Um, uh, you know, this history is it, it's more established in visual art because the artists have been working with abstraction for hundreds of years. Um, but in music, uh, the relationship between representation and abstraction is a little bit more complicated. Um, and that's because music is inherently abstract. You know, in music, you can't you can't take a violin and recreate the sound. You can't recreate a very accurate sound of like a dog barking or a building burning or whatever, right? Um, and that's not to say that composers for hundreds of years have not tried to recreate sonic environments of our own physical environment. Um, Western music is filled with compositions that suggest representations of our environment. Uh, compositions like Debussy's La Mure or Vivaldi's Rite of Spring, I mean, just to name a couple, uh, they do a very interesting job um, of suggesting these uh, sonic uh, aspects of our environment. Um, but it's always more of a suggestion than a representation. Um, and there's a very simple reason for this. Uh, why composers have never been able to sort of create a, a, a literal copy of our environment. Um, and that's because the tools they're using, their instruments, uh, are inadequate for this purpose. Uh, the timbre of Western musical instruments is, is mostly fixed. Uh, the timbre, which, which, which can also be thought of as the harmonic structure of a sound, um, it's always a function of the, the physical characteristics of, of, of the instrument. Um, so without changing the physical design of the instrument, you can't really change the timbre. Uh, I mean, there are exceptions to this. Like one interesting uh, exception is um, a mute on uh, a brass instrument. Um, mostly the way that, that jazz musicians use this mute, um, it actually acts as a sort of filter to rearrange the, the harmonic structure of sounds. Um, but it would still be hard to make a dog bark with the mute, uh, um, yeah. So um, I guess this brings me to why I'm interested in um, electronic music and, and sound synthesis. You know, with, with electronic music, the harmonic structures of sounds, it's almost infinitely editable. Uh, you can modify the harmonic structure of a recording, you can take the harmonic structure of one sound and apply it to another. You can take two different harmonic structures and morph them together over time, um, or you can create your own harmonic structures uh, from scratch. Um, and this is what I did for, for Welcome Home Habitat. I, I built the harmonic structure of various, various sounds that, that exist in the rainforest. Um, so um, a, a huge part of this process of recreating these harmonic structures has to do with isolating the individual sounds of various, you know, birds, monkeys, uh, insects, rain, um, wind, um, and uh, analyzing the harmonic structure of each of these sounds independently. Um, and, and to do this, I, I use the technique known as Fourier analysis. Um, so Fourier analysis, at its most basic level, kind of states that uh, any complex sound can be broken down and analyzed as a series of simple sine waves at different frequencies and amplitudes. Um, and the great thing about modern computers is that we can use software to do this analysis. Um, so I think next I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a program uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit of how I analyzed these sounds, how I broke down the harmonic structures, and uh, basically how I recreated these from the analysis. Okay, um, we are now inside the software application known as AudioSculpt. And AudioSculpt is a tool that automatically runs Fourier analysis on, on recorded samples of sound. And the example I have here is uh, a bird sound. And uh, this bird is a tinamou. 
This is a bird found in the rainforest. Um, and if you look at the top part of this window, you can see uh, a traditional amplitude waveform of the sound. And I'm just going to play through it really quick. Okay, that's the sound of the tinamau. Um, I chose this sound because it's it's harmonically a relatively simple uh, sound in terms of the uh, complexity of the rainforest sounds. Um, there's not a lot of harmonic density to this. You can you can even hear it. It almost sounds like it almost sounds like a sine wave when you play it back. So. Like I said, on the top here, we have a traditional waveform that horizontally represents time and vertically represents the amplitude or the loudness of the sound. Um, but more importantly, the window on the bottom, this is a sonogram of the sound. And this represents all of the frequency information of the sound. Um, you, can, you can derive uh, conclusions about the pitch of the sound, but more importantly to, to, to my purposes for the installation, is it's a tool that I can derive the harmonic structure of the sound from. So if we make this a little bit larger, you can see the sonogram obviously is kind of color coded. And uh, the cooler elements uh, represent frequencies of harmonic partials that uh, are lower in amplitude. And then the really hot ones in the center represent the uh, the sounds that are that are higher in, in amplitude the the harmonic partials that are higher in amplitude and these red and orange ones are essentially uh, what's making up the timbre of the sound so one thing we can do is we can isolate some of the uh, portions of the sound and we can kind of listen to the way the different harmonics function. So for instance, if I was just to draw a little square here, and I don't include any of the hot portions, we can hear what that sounds like. I mean, it doesn't sound like much of anything because there are no harmonics that are um, uh, high enough in amplitude that our ears can can hear it so well. Now if I were to move this down to include the red and orange portions, you can basically hear the entire spectrum of the sound. If I move it below the red and orange portions, you can hear so in much of the same way that uh, the portions above the red and orange harmonics didn't emit much sound, uh, the portions below the red and orange harmonics are also very quiet. Now, one last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compress this rectangle to where it only includes a very narrow band of the red and orange sounds. And this should be sort of the purest representation of the timbre of this bird. Okay, and we can even do things like filter more or less of the background harmonics, uh, which are, are very, very low in amplitude, inaudible in fact. Um, but this is a good visual representation of the structure of that bird sound.
Um, and then lastly, and, and most importantly, we're going to look over here at this window. Let me compress this one. Okay, so this window, this window represents right here on the right, it represents all of the individual harmonic partials uh, based on a given snapshot, an instantaneous snapshot of this bird sound. So as I'm moving my cursor over here, it's changing the harmonic representation of the instantaneous position that I'm at. So if I move it all the way over here, you can see all those harmonics are shifting a little bit, but they're not shifting that much. You can see that the loudest harmonic, the highest in amplitude, doesn't really change much. It's always the same harmonic that is the loudest. And that's important because that's the fundamental harmonic of, of this uh, bird sound. And then, so the, the, the fundamental harmonic is important because that, that's what uh, determines the, the sort of pitch that we perceive. Even though there are a lot of harmonics in this sound at various different frequencies, uh, since one is louder than all the others, uh, our ears perceive that as, as the pitch. And it's the same way with, uh, you know, orchestral instruments or, or, or human voice or whatever. Um, this harmonic here is the fundamental harmonic of the bird sound. So, um, if we zoom in a little bit more, we can kind of see, we can see the harmonics of the red and orange areas. So if I want to draw a conclusion about this fundamental harmonic, what we can say about it is uh, horizontally on the bottom here, on this sort of bottom grid, this represents the amplitude of the harmonic. And we can see that it's, uh, it's probably about negative 15 dB. And I can zoom in on that and see, yeah, it's about, negative 16. And over here, on this vertical section of the grid, uh, this is the frequency of that harmonic. So using the vertical frequency and the horizontal amplitude, I'm able to draw a really uh, accurate conclusion of uh, the, the harmonic structure of this bird. So if we want to uh, if we want to uh, note the frequency of this fundamental harmonic, we can see over here that it is, it's about 1,340 hertz. Um, get a little bit more detailed. So it starts at about, yeah, it starts at about uh, 1,345 hertz. Um, that is uh, 1.345 kilohertz. So we know the amplitude of the harmonic. We know the frequency of the harmonic. We know that within the range of the red and orange uh, spectrum, there are about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight harmonics. And this is exactly um, the information that I need to go about reconstructing all of these individual sounds. So I, I note, I take all of these individual harmonic partials and I note the frequency and the amplitude. And from there, it's just a matter of uh, assigning oscillators. And you can, I, I did this in a few programs, but this analysis portion is really the most important. So I'm just gonna kind of show this. But what I did is I, I took the eight partials, um, I assigned oscillators with sine waves uh, to, to those unique frequencies and amplitudes, and, and that's it. And I, that's how you have the basic harmonic structure, the timbre uh, of any sound. You assign uh, sine wave oscillators uh, as a representation of each individual 
harmonic, uh, noting their frequency and amplitude. And, uh, and you play those together, you, those eight oscillators, and you have the, uh, the timbre of, of the bird, uh, the monkey, the, uh, the insect, the, uh, whatever, whatever the rainforest, right? So anyway, that's that. And I'm going to look at a couple more programs to show you how this is kind of all assembled next. Okay, so the last thing I'd like to show is the final project that I use to assemble all of the sounds after they've been synthesized and edited. Uh, this is the final project that um, actually plays back all of the sounds uh, in, inside the room at the Botanical Gardens. Um, so over here on the left, uh, some of these folders here are color-coded. You can see orange, blue, green, red, and so on. Those represent uh, all of the tracks and all of the sounds that come from each individual speaker. Uh, the color-coded folders represent uh, individual speakers. And I'll just play, I'll just go ahead and play back the entire project. So this is exactly what we inside the room. And just to show you all, I'll isolate, I'll just pick one of these random tracks. This is, uh, I don't know what this is, some kind of insect. Let's see. And I can just kind of start adding sounds Oops. and that's the entire project uh, so I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to conclude the, uh, the talk here, and uh, I guess we're going to take some questions now. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Kevin, if you can come on video and sound. Welcome. Thanks so hey, much. Thank yeah, yeah, thank you, Neshka. Um, thank you so much for that granular look, because I know over the course of time that you were working on this project and you were telling me about all these files, it's really quite amazing to see it mapped out on a screen like that, because those are the tools that you're using, right? And I know, uh, yeah, so um, I know that I've told you this before, but for the benefit of the audience, we have lots of scientists here at the garden that regularly go to rainforest regions around the world, and they've all been impressed with how you've been able to capture an actual rainforest. Um, the, can you tell me a little bit more uh, about the loop, like the full length and kind of the orchestration of how you decided to put the sounds in in different sections? Because when you're in the in the gallery, you can actually spend quite a bit of time listening to a, a wide variety of sounds. Yeah, um, yeah. First of all, you know it's uh, it's interesting that you that you mentioned uh, speaking with the scientists about this because all those tools uh, that I showed, uh, all those tools for 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 harmonic manipulation, they're really uh, used by scientists as much as. Probably, I mean, actually, a lot more than they are artists. Um, but it's it's, uh, it's tools that uh, a lot of different scientists can use can use actually, and and those kinds of uh, 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 those kinds of harmonic manipulations can be applied to a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, in, anyway, I uh, you know the you ask about the the total length and 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 how long is the loop? I really don't know or remember. It's probably around 20, 30 minutes or so. Uh, but I'd have to check on that because I changed it a few times. I, um, I, yeah, uh, uh, I know it's seamless, but I, I don't remember the exact length. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, one of the last times I think we talked, yeah, one of the last editions, I think it was something like, I thought it was about 45 minutes. Yeah, maybe it's closer to an hour. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it, ha it has been a long time and it's uh it's a little bit of an intense environment so it's it's a little bit it's fatiguing uh on your ears to 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 listen to that for for a long period of time um but uh but i think that's to me that's what that's what made it really interesting to uh to that's why it was interesting to create it because it is something that can uh i see it functioning kind of as as, as physical almost like a physical sculpture in a room because the sound uh coming from all directions it, it does become sort of uh it comes it becomes sort of heavy and it occupies a kind of weight like a physical sculpture would that's so true i'm so glad you described that because it um you know for for anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to listen to the piece and experience it you're absolutely right there is sort of a weight in in the room at different times and the orchestration because that's what it seems like to me is almost like this right the symphony in a way because you you're listening and sometimes you can hear you know you single sounds playing it as, and then sometimes there's like a cacophony where you have a ton of sounds all kind of happening at the same time um you know and then there's like this rainstorm where you can actually it's as if you're outdoors underneath uh, all of these leaves that are getting pelted with water too so uh there's a pretty wide range of experiences and then when it you can tell when the that storm passes all of a sudden it quiets just similarly to our rainstorms here you know like all of a sudden it sort of clears the air a little bit and you can um you it, you just hear a handful of maybe bugs or something like that so it really there's quite a crescendo and then also some sort of peaks and valleys through the course um did you how how long did it take you to sort of study all of these sounds and figure out which creatures you were going to um include well i mean it took a while it took a while i mean I, most of the most of the project was was research and analysis i mean the the actual creating of the sounds probably took probably took about 60 hours but uh the research and the analysis i was doing i don't know probably for about six months you know um i don't know maybe uh 40 hours per month um yeah but yeah it's uh because i you know i'm not a i'm not a a botanist a plant expert nor have i ever into a rainforest so so it was really important uh to me to really study a lot of recordings first uh from from the rainforest and and uh luckily there's uh, there's really good documentation online a lot of people doing field recordings uh of audio in the rainforest so so i was able to you know to get a really good idea of what it sounded like and um as far as you know choosing the, the creatures uh well, I don't, you know, it, it it was kind of just a matter of uh, figuring out uh, which which creatures exist kind of the, the most in the rainforest and uh, and then trying to find good examples of them where I could analyze the harmonic structure and and uh, and study uh, the, the timbre of those sounds. Yeah. And I know you often are looking at communication in the work that you do. Now, I came to you and asked you specifically to create something, right, that would address this subject matter of plants and sounds. Uh, was it something that, how, like, was it something that you felt like immediately came to you, or was it something that you sort of had to think about for a bit as to how you're going to represent it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's true. I mean, a, a lot of my work does deal with um, with language and, and, and communication. So this was it was an it was an interesting challenge to, uh, you know, not only not only find the sounds and and recreate them and and, and arrange them in a certain way. Um, but it was also, uh, you know, an interesting challenge to learn um, how, how these insects and, and birds are all communicating with each other and i mean one of the things one of the things i i, I kind of learned early on is that we, we don't know as much as maybe I, I thought we would know about uh the way that they communicate and it's uh and it's fascinating and um i think that uh you know that there's all sorts of sonic information you know floating around between between all these creatures and this is this is one of the kind of things I envision when I when I talk about it being a gift to the plants um I think about the the kind of the the kind of sonic characteristics that that they've uh that, that they've evolved uh to 
to you know deal with on a daily basis and and i wonder about uh you know what what that information is is contributing to the plant's health and it's uh it's a way that it, a way of evolving in a healthy way um so you know i it, it, it the communication aspect i mean it was always fascinating um but it, it but it's all but it's always just really interesting to to study things that that are unstudied and and you know the world we're not we're not so familiar with the way that uh the sonic environment affects the the health of 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 plants and so this was kind of yeah that was kind of my idea yeah, it's true because everything is very human centric, right? In a lot of right. what we, when we consider uh, when it comes to sound, like we think of things that affect us, but don't necessarily immediately assume that they might also affect the other beings or creatures, you know, other species of things that are around us. Um, uh, you're very active in St. Louis as an artist and uh, you know performer. Would you like to tell our audience? Um, uh, some of the other things you might be working on or other way, other places to see your work? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I guess this winter, I'm kind of uh, more in uh, performance mode. So I've, uh, I've been doing uh, a lot of uh, sound and video performances. I, I, last weekend, I, I, we had one at the, um, at the downtown central library in the auditorium. And uh that was with the uh, organization that I, I work for, uh, Herding Cats Collective, um, and we also did a performance at the uh, uh, at the Botanical Garden um, a few months back. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, I don't have anything coming up off the top of my head, but uh, uh, I, I'm sure I'll be doing something soon. <laughs> well, it, yes, it seems like you have a lot going on, so I wanted to give you yeah, an opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, also, like there's some things in the works, but I can't really say the dates yet. So yeah, sure, no, no, that's fine. And for those of you on Instagram, you can find Kevin at Afterlife Laboratories. He's been posting a little more regularly, um, so you can see some cool shots of things that he's taken care of. Uh, and you can see a lot of what he's done in the past um, at his website, KevinHarrisArt.org. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for creating such a beautiful installation that truly incorporates plants and sounds in a way that I hadn't envisioned and I'm so thrilled with and I know our visitors are as well for the show. Um, it was also a total pleasure to work with you. Um, and uh, I wanna thank you for creating the talk for today as well. It was great to have you here and to get a little bit more insight into what you do and how you did it for the show. Um, and uh, just to let everyone else know, um, our final talk in the series is next week on Thursday, same time, 1230 Central. Um, and you can find the link in the chat uh, to sign up for that last one. Um, but Kevin, thank you so much. It was so great to have you. Yeah, thank you, Nishka. Uh, and, and, and thank you for uh, putting up with me uh, during all of this. And yeah, you've been great to work with. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.